Okay, um, let's move on. In the last class, we started out to look at terms and we saw that um, terms are a necessity in order to correctly describe the um, optical properties of coordination compounds. So the ligand field theory alone is still not um, enough for, for that. Um, so the last um, point that we discussed where how we can derive um, the terms of a particular electron configuration using a, a microstate table. And um, we have used the example of a D2 electron configuration of a free ion to show this. So um, I just briefly repeat um, the outcomes of the last class. So we had <clears throat> in this table, the um, capital ML values um, here on the X coordinate and the MS values on the Y coordinates. And then um, we indicated um, the possible states uh, by um, an, an X. And then we drew boxes into this um, table. So we started with the largest possible box. Okay, which gives us gave us the first term, which uh, <clears throat> is a three F term, and then we went to the next largest possible box, which was this one here, and this one here represented the one G term, and this box here then represented the three P term. <clears throat> this box here represented. Um, a one D term, and there was a single microstate which belonged <clears throat> to a one S term. So I wanted to add that um, we have um, triplet terms here and uh, singlet terms. Um, in triplet terms, we do have um, microstates in which um, electrons are unpaired. However, we have also microstates in which electrons are being paired, okay? So for instance, when we look at all the axes here in the red box, some of the red axes have a capital MS of equal to zero, and that's actually these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So actually seven of the 21 microstates in which the electrons are being paired. Okay, nonetheless, um, this is a, a triplet term because we have also a number of uh, microstates in which the electrons are, uh, are not being paired. Okay, whereas when you have a singlet state, yeah, like for instance, a 1G state, then you really have only microstates in which all um, spins are being paired and you have no microstates in which uh, spins are not paired. So this is actually the actual difference between uh, a triplet state and a singlet state. Also in the triplet state, you have um, microstate with paired spins, but you have in addition also some with unpaired spins, whereas in the singlet state, all the um, electrons must have paired spins. So please keep this in mind. Okay. So now we have determined all the terms. So now let us look at um, what is the relative energy of these terms. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> we need to understand that um, the higher um, the spin multiplicity, the lower the energy, and that follows from Hund's rule. So Hund's rule says that, well, we should maximize the number of spins um, if we do so, then the energy of our electron configuration is lower. So that means that in our example, the triplet states should have a lower in it, uh, the, the triplet terms should have a lower energy than the singlet terms. Okay. So now there's a second rule. When the spin multiplicity is the same, then the energy increases with increasing L value. 
Okay. Um, so that means that, um, um, sorry, the energy must decrease with increasing L value. So that means that um, uh, an S term actually has a higher energy than a P term, which has a higher energy than a D term. And this is actually the inverse of uh, what you know from orbitals, where you always have the case that when the quantum number N is the same, the S orbital has a lower energy than the P orbital and the D orbital. So with the terms, it's actually exactly the other way around. So now when considering these two rules, you can order the um, relative term energies that you would expect. So what would you expect for our example? Well, the um, a, a three F term, which has the highest L value, and please uh, notice again here that there's a mistake and I need to fix this. Um, has the has the lowest energy, okay? Because we have a triplet state, and L is equal to um, a three, okay? Then we would expect that we have the three p term um, as the next lowest um, energy state. So this is still a triplet term, but for p, the well, L value is uh, one, which is lower than three. And then we have the single terms to consider. The G comes for D, which comes before S, because <clears throat> G is associated with an L value of uh, four, D is associated with an L value of two, and S is associated with an L value of zero. So this is what we would expect. Now, uh, reality is somewhat different. So the actual uh, real uh, term energy sequence is that indeed the three F term is the lowest as you would expect, but the one D term is actually lower than the three P term, okay? And that's essentially why Hund's rule is called a rule and not a law. There are exceptions from that rule. And here you see one exception and it's not easily possible to uh, predict these ex exceptions with, uh, uh, without uh, detailed uh, quantum mechanical calculations. Okay, um, now what are the um, free ion terms of other uh, D electron uh, configurations? So uh, what about uh, D1? So for D1, we have only one ele electron. And because of that, we have only one term, which is a, a 2D term. So how can we understand this? Um, we can understand this um, when we say that, well, um, our one electron could be filled in any of the five orbitals, either spin up or spin down. Um, but uh, the term symbol is determined by the microstate in which um, the quantum number ML is maximized and in which the quantum number MS is maximized. So for that reason, we would want to fill our electron, spin up into the orbital, which has the highest quantum number ML. Okay. So now if ML is equal to two, then also uh, the total angular quantum number, the total angular orbital quantum number L is equal to two. And L equal to two refers to a D term. Okay. So now um, the spin is up. Okay. Therefore, is, therefore um, MS is actually plus a half. Yeah. Ms is plus a half, and then uh, 2s plus 1 is 2 times plus a half plus 1, which is 2, which uh, represents the uh, 2 here in the, in the front. Okay, so now how many microstates do belong the, to the, this term? Well, 
the number of microstates is given by the formula 2L plus 1 um, times 2S plus um, 1, which would in this case give 10. And why does this give 10? Because um, we can place this electron here into any of the five orbitals, and it doesn't matter whether it's spin up or spin down. There are no electron electron interactions possible. And therefore, all the energies of all the possible microstates are being the same. Okay. So um, now let us go from the D1 to the D3, the D2 we already previously considered. So as we have more electrons, we have more possibilities to fill these electrons into the orbitals, and therefore the number of the permutations increase, and therefore also the number of the term tends to increase. All right. So for instance, for D3, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different terms. So we could think about, well, what is the, the, the ground term? Maybe that's something you can um, tell me according to the rules, what would be the ground term here? The term with the lowest energy. So first of all, we need to determine the term, the terms which have the highest spin multiplicity. Okay. So now we have spin multiplicities of two and four here. So that means that because four is more than two, the four uh, p in the four f terms would have a lower energy than the other terms. But now we still need to compare the four f and the four p. Now F is associated with a higher quantum number L. So therefore the 4F should be lower than the 4P and the 4F should actually be our um, ground term. Okay. Then for instance, 44, we have even more uh, terms. We could again see what is actually the ground term on this, so the term with the high spin multiplicity in this case is uh, this term here. Okay, so this is a quintet term. Otherwise, we have only singlet um, and triplet terms. So this makes this um, five D term our ground term. Okay, so now for the D five electron um, configuration, um, we have. A doublet, quartet, and even six dead terms to consider. So therefore, we would choose uh, the six dead term as our ground term. There's no other six dead, six dead um, term around. So um, as we go uh, from D5 to D6 to D7 to D8 to D9, um, the number of uh, possible electron permutations and the number of um, terms again starts to decline. Okay. And that is essentially because um, unoccupied electronic states behave just like um, occupied electronic states uh, from a statistic standpoint. Okay. So for that reason, um, the D6 electron configuration um, <clears throat> has the same terms as the D4 electron configuration, okay? Because in the D4 electron configuration, we have uh, four occupied states and six unoccupied states, which is statistically the same as having 
um, six occupied states and four unoccupied states. We can permute those in the same way. So for the same reason, um, the D7 electron configuration has this same number of states compared to the D3 electron configuration. The D8 electron configuration has the same number of terms as the D2 electron configuration. And the D9 electron configuration has the same number of terms as the D1 electron configuration. Okay, so now what about D10? So the D10 has um, only one term associated with it. Um, and the term symbol is um, 1s. We can again easily derive in this case why it is 1s. Um, <clears throat> so for the 10 electron configuration, naturally all our um, d orbitals must be occupied. Okay, and our 10 electrons uh, will have ML, ML values between minus two and plus two. So now the capital ML value, which is just the sum of the ML values, will therefore be just, well, two times minus two, okay? These two electrons times minus two, plus two times minus one, okay? That accounts for these two electrons, plus two times zero, which accounts for these two electrons, plus two times plus one, which accounts for these two electrons, and two times plus two, which accounts for these two electrons. And when you add that up, then that gives zero. Okay, so now in this case, um, this uh, capital ML value is also uh, the maximum ML value possible because it's the only one. Therefore, it determines the total orbital spin um, um, quantum number um, L, which is therefore also naturally zero. So when L is equal to zero, then that means that we have an F star. So now why is this a one S term? That is because, well, all um, um, electrons naturally must be paired, okay? So there cannot be any unpaired electrons. And for that reason, that must be a singlet um, term, okay? Now, how many microstates are associated with this, with this term? Well, there will only be um, one microstate associated with this term. All right. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Um, then um, and the next step, um, we now need to consider what is called a spin orbit orbit coupling. So for now, we have only um, accounted for the interaction of the um, um, angular magnetic moment with the angular momentum um, with each other and the interaction of the spins with each other. But there's also an interaction between the angular momenta with the spin, and that's called spin orbit coupling. Okay, so this is expressed by an additional quantum number J, whereby J can run from L plus S to L um, minus S, and that can lead to additional. Um, um, term splitting to additional terms. So a full term symbol is then being described by <clears throat> the um, L value, the spin multiplicity two is a plus one and the quantum number J, which is added as a subscript um, behind um, the symbol um, dictated by the quantum number L. 
Okay, um, so now let us determine um, for a number of examples, um, how many additional states are being created <clears throat> for the three, for three P, for a one D and for a one S term due to this spin orbit coupling. Okay, so let us first consider the three P term. So for the three P term, um, um, L is equal to one. So P term is associated with L is equal to one. And because we have a triplet term, um, S is actually um, one. So that means that L plus S is one plus one is equal to two. Okay, so now um, what is L minus S? Well, L minus S is one minus one is equal to zero. So what values can J therefore adopt? Well, it can adopt any value between L plus one and L minus one, integer numbers, of course. And so J can be either zero, one or two. And for that reason, our uh, 3P um, term splits up into three terms due to the spin orbit coupling, which are being called 3P0, 3P1, and 3P2, respectively. Okay, so now what about the other two? the 1D and the 1S. Let us first look at the 1D. So for the 1D, um, L is equal to two. Okay, he's associated with two. And S is um, zero because we have a zinc term. So therefore two plus zero is equal to two. So now what is L minus zero? Well, L minus, uh, so what is L minus S? Well, it's two minus U, which is also two. Now J can vary between L plus S and L minus S. So therefore, in this case, J can only adopt one value, which is two, okay? And therefore, for the 1D term, there's no uh, splitting into more terms. Um, we can all just more fully describe um, this term as a 1D2 term if we take into account the spin orbit coupling. So last but not least, let us look at the 1S term. Okay, now what is L plus S? So L is equal to um, zero for an S term, yeah? And um, for a singular term, well, S is also equal to zero. Okay, so we have L plus S being zero plus zero is equal to zero. So now what is L minus S? Well, L minus S is zero minus zero, which is also zero. Okay, so that determines that J is equal to zero and there's only one J value possible. Therefore, this one S term also does split up into multiple other terms. We can just more fully describe it as a one S zero term when taking into account the spin orbit coupling. So now, um, how important is the spin orbit coupling for the interpretation of electronic spectra? The answer is not very important. That is because the energy difference of the states are being very small. Okay, typically only in the order of tens of uh, wave numbers. Okay, so the energy difference between the 3p0 and the 3p1 and the 3p2 are, are very, very small. Okay, much smaller than the energy difference between a p and a d or P or S or D or an S, okay, which are typically in the order of tens of thousands of wave numbers. So therefore, um, we usually ne neglect um, the spin orbit coupling 
since the energy difference are not very relevant for the interpretation of the electronic spectra. Okay. So now um, let us continue this and build on this. By now considering, just change, need to change the screen, share here. Now, where's my, where did my Zoom meeting go? Yeah. What happened to my Zoom meeting? Can you all still hear me? Can you please say something? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I don't know where my my Zoom Zoom button went. It's, it's, all, it's all of a sudden disappeared here. We can still see your screen and hear you, though. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, switched to um, another, I don't want to launch another Zoom meeting. So where is my... Just minimize the number of things here. Maybe if you have like a desktop button, you can uh, show every panel on your desktop in one big thing and switch between them. Yeah, I'm I'm really confused now. Did my my Zoom meeting go? Yeah. Can I? Go back to my Zoom meeting. I can hear you. I can hear you. Just don't don't see the. The Zoom screen anymore. If you have uh, Windows, if there's a task view button to the left of the Windows bar on the start bar, you can maybe click the task view button and see if that can show all of your windows at once. A few buttons. Why is that all of all of a sudden disappeared? Well, it happens to other professors also. <laughs> we can. Wait. Yeah, wait a moment. So let's see if I can, if I or minimize these windows here, whether I can find it, find it again. I see here lecture 30 is in progress, but but how can I, I really don't get it. Yeah, it says in progress. I'm totally puzzled. Maybe no, what you do? Like I don't know how to get back. Maybe if you hit control alt delete, you can start your task manager and then uh, use that to switch to zoom to control alternate. Control alternate and delete. Control alternate and delete. And then click the task manager. Task manager, yeah. And now on the task manager, can you see zoom as one of the tasks that's open? 
Uh, actually, no. <laughs> wow. It's not. It, it's it's say telling me it's not open. It's telling me Zoom is not open, even though I can still hear you. Wow. <laughs> well, that's that's certainly a glitch. Yeah, that that is actually uh, not how it is supposed to be. No. So, well, I do one thing. I go back into course side and I, 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 I click on the button in course side again, which is associated with the Zoom meeting. Now let's see what happens. So maybe that's a, that's a way. So I'm clicking start meeting now again. So I hope, I hope nothing bad happens. We'll see. Your screen is being paused now, I see. Now, new share. This share. So, yeah, now I'm, it seems that I'm back, but it still tells me that my screen is being paused. Now, I have no idea what that means. Or oh, resume share. There's a button resume share, but when I click it, Nothing happens. Okay, now I just stop share because so now I see you guys again. Um, so now I just start the share again. Let's go here and let's go there. And now everything seems to be normal. So now you can see my screen share again. Yep, yep, we see so now you. Now I here. start the presentation. Sounds good. All right, we are still recording, so we are not interrupted. So we are back. Okay, that was a little complicated. Okay, so um, previously we discussed um, the terms of a free ion. So that means um, we looked at an ion which is not coordinated by any ligands. So now let's look at what happens to these terms as uh, that ion um, gets coordinated by ligands. And let's look, by example, at the case of an octahedral complex, um, which is influenced by an, by an octahedral ligand field. OK, um, so now. Um, the thing is that um, terms behave in an octahedral ligand field like um, um, orbitals behave in an octahedral ligand field. And they split uh, just analogously. So, so that's because, well, um, terms are wave functions that have particular symmetry, which is um, the same as um, the associated orbitals, they also split in energy um, and in terms of symmetry analogously to orbitals. So that means uh, when we have an octahedral ligand field that a D term, for instance, would split into an, an EG term and a T2G term. That means into a term that has EG symmetry and uh, T to G symmetry, respectively, just like the D orbitals in an octahedral field would split into D orbitals uh, of EG symmetry and uh, D orbitals of T to G symmetry. Okay, so this the same also happens uh, to other terms. So, for instance, a P term will behave like P orbitals in an octahedral ligand field. Um, so um, p orbitals have T2, T1G symmetry in an octahedral ligand field. So a p term also has T1G symmetry. Okay. So there's no splitting in this case because um, um, like, um, uh, like a p uh, like there are uh, three p orbitals um, that are triply generated and therefore having the same energy. There are there's the p term which has also the triply generated t one g symmetry. Therefore, it doesn't split. Um, so 
um, now the S term has always like the S orbital, the totally symmetric symmetry type, which is A1G. Okay, so now let's go back to our D2 electron configuration in the octahedral um, ligand field. Um, yeah, here I forgot to say that the F and F term would split into T1G plus T2G plus A2G. So now let us consider um, what really happens um, to a uh, well, D2 um, ion in an octahedral ligand field. So we previously determined that for the two ion, we have uh, the three F term, which is our ground term. Then we have the one B, the three P, the one G and the one S. And this should be, um, they should have an energy that follows um, the scheme here. So initially we have a free ion. That means that we have no field, okay? So now let's add an octahedral field to that. And now we will create additional terms, okay? So for the, for the F term, we will create um, three, okay? A three A2G, a three T2G, a three T1G. For the D, as we said, we will create a T2G and EG. Um, they need to be both singlet terms. So for the 3P term, we will have a 3T1G term. So it, uh, G term splits into one, two, three, four terms that have A, a one, A1G, one T2G, one T1G, and one EG symmetry. And the S term, as we discussed, doesn't split in energy, it has the totally symmetric symmetry type um, one A1G. So now um, the, the energies, uh, they uh, further change as the um, field increases. Okay? So as we make the field uh, very uh, from uh, stronger and go from a weak field uh, to very strong, um, field, the the orbitals of these states change, and the entire diagram that results from that is a so-called um, correlation diagram. So, for instance, when you look at these uh, three F terms here, which are the ground term, um, one of them uh, moves down in energy, which is the three T one G term, which you now find here while the other two move up in energy to the three T to G term you find now here, for instance, and the um, three uh, A to G term, um, you actually now find, find here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this of course is an additional uh, complication for the electronic spectra. We already started out with one, two, three, four, five terms with no field. And now we have even more states to consider and their relative energy depends on how strong our field is. So now we can go from um, a very strong field to a theoretical case of a, a infinitely strong field. And then you would have actually the case that these four terms here would become identical in energy. These four terms here become identical in energy. And these three terms become identical in energy. And then you would have a situation which is actually um, similar um, to the situation that the ligand field theory would predict. Okay, so the ligand field theory doesn't take electron electron interactions into account. But when you have a very strong external um, electrostatic field, um, which is infinitely strong, then the electron electron interactions uh, become naturally liable in comparison to the um, um, external field. And so uh, you can neglect them again. 
And therefore, um, situation that arises from an infinitely strong field okay, is, uh, well, um, identical to the situation uh, that the ligand field theory would predict. Okay, so in the ligand field theory, um, according to ligand field theory, there could be three possible electronic states. Okay, the ground state in which the two electrons are being in the P to G orbitals, one excited state in which one electron is in the ground state and one electron is in the excited state and another excited state in which both electrons are in the excited state. Okay. For that reason, um, we can actually say that when we have an infinitely strong um, ligand field, um, we have basically three different three different terms, and we can call this one the T two G two term, reflecting two electrons in the ground state according to ligand field theory, the T two G E G term in which one electron is still in the ground state and the other electron is being excited and an EG term in which um, both electrons are being excited. Okay, um, so now let us uh, um, think further which electron transitions we would expect. So as I mentioned previously, as we go from a weak field to a very strong field, we have many different uh, terms. And therefore we would expect many, many different electron transitions possible, which would lead to a very complicated electronic spectrum. So now fortunately nature makes it a little uh, simpler for us because what is called the selection rules. So the selection rules determine which electron transitions are allowed. So that means that not all electron transitions that are theoretically possible are actually happening for a number of reasons. Um, so the first reason is the spin selection rule, which states that only transitions with delta S is equal to zero are allowed. That means nothing else, but we can only have electron transitions in which the spin of the electron is not being reversed because as we discussed uh, previously, um, spin reversal is actually a quantum mechanically forbidden process. So the second um, rule is the Laporte rule, which states that um, transitions are only allowed when the parity changes, that means that we go from a state with G symmetry to a state of U symmetry or vice versa. So based on these two rules, how many electron transitions would actually be allowed? Okay, so now let's go back to our correlation diagram and look at um, the number of allowed transitions. How many transitions would be allowed? Can you read this? Nobody knows the answer? So the answer is zero. Okay, because you see that um, the states are all G states, all G states. So we could never go from a G state to a U state or vice versa. Okay, so that means actually no electron transition should be allowed. However, these two rules do not hold equally strictly. So the selection rule actually really holds strictly. Um, while the report rule doesn't hold strictly, so that that means that there's still statistically um, a relatively high probability um, for electron transitions in which the parity does actually not change. And therefore, we usually ignore the Laporte rule because of 
practicality. Okay. Practically, we still will still see optical absorption that violate the Laporte rule. Okay. So now, according to that, how many electron transitions would we actually um, expect? And we can go back in order to answer this. Um, so you see that our, our ground state would actually be a, a triplet state. And therefore we would expect um, that from um, this state here, which will be our uh, uh, ground state being being a triplet state would be able to excite into other triplet states. Okay, so now how many would we have? Well, we have one, two, three. So that would mean that we would expect that three possible transitions, three possible transitions from the ground state. Okay, um, so now we can um, represent a correlation diagram somewhat differently. And this is expressed by um, what is called a uh, tanabi sugano um, diagram. So the major difference is that um, the ground state is being plotted as a horizontal line and that the energy of all the other states is being plotted relative to the ground state, okay? For all possible um, ligand field strengths. So the ligand field strength um, delta um, is uh, measured in the unit of B. So B is a so-called Waka parameter. I do not want to go into much detail what this is. So that is just a quantum mechanical parameter um, that um, uh, measures the well electrostatic interactions between between electrons. So it's nothing else but a convenient energy unit to measure the ligand field strength. Just nothing but a uh, uh, energy unit. Okay. So now now here is the actual energy of the uh, terms also expressed. Uh, in units of the Wacker parameter um, B. When you see now <clears throat> here, the energies of all the different terms for different ligand field strength. So now you see that, well, our 3T1 term is the, is the ground state. And um, well, all the other terms are representing um, excited, excited states. You see also that some lines are actually being straight, while other lines are actually being bent. <clears throat> so um, why are some lines straight and why are some lines bent? So this again is due to, well, interactions between terms of the same symmetry. You have learned that for orbitals, when orbitals have the same symmetry type, they can interact with each other. And also terms, when they have the same symmetry type, can interact with each other. And the closer they are in energy, <coughs> sorry, the more strongly they can interact. And that leads to the bending of these lines. So I <clears throat> want to illustrate this here. Um, so we have here actually the field strength is the energy of the term. So let's um, consider two terms of the same symmetry type independently and assume that they're not interacting. Then there's the possibility that one term goes up in energy and one term goes down in energy and the energies actually cross. So now imagine that the closer the energies come, the more stronger the interactions actually are. And that leads to the fact that when we account for these interactions, that these two terms actually bend away from each other. These two lines bend away from each other. You see this, for instance, um, for these two terms, which have both A1, A1 symmetry, they are bending into opposite directions 
because they can interact with each other because they have the same symmetry. Okay, whereas um, terms that are associated with term symbols that are unique do not appear the second time in the um, diagram, then these lines are straight because there's no other term this particular term can interact with. So I just see that our time is over. So let us uh, stop the recording.